Welcome back to this series of Black Hat Fast Chats. Terry Sweeney here with Black Hat, and I'm joined now by Roger Grimes, data-driven defense evangelist from Know Before. Uh, great title. Roger, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thanks. Um, we're talking about multi-factor authentication, um, a subject you've written extensively about, um, plus all the ways to hack MFA. Why don't we start by just if you could tell us some of your, your uh, MFA favorites, uh, with your, some of your uh, go-tos or... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I probably have more MFAs that I don't like, but, uh, you know, MFA solutions that I do like, uh, certainly comes from the, if the, if the vendor does uh, security development lifecycle, making sure that the code is uh, secure and the actual solution, you know, I, I don't like using SMS-based options, but uh, phone apps are pretty good if you have a phone app, especially if it's kind of like a push-based phone app where it asks you to do something like that. I like the time-based, one-time password type solutions or, that are out there, as long as they have some expiring codes. And I mean, not only expiring codes for, you know, th those update, those one-time passwords you get, those little codes are good for 30 seconds or a minute, but even uh, they usually start with a code or a QR code or something like that. Some of them, uh, those codes never expire. And if people leave them in their inbox or their deleted items, they can be used to recreate a second additional in, uh, instance of it. Uh, but I, I like those. You know, I, I like, um, you know, some of the, the hardware, the hardware ones that you might plug in, as long as they're two-factor. Some of them, like if you just plug them in, or you plug them in and you just push a button, that's really single factor. And that to me is a little bit dangerous because if you lose it, somebody plugs it in, they become you. So I like, like two-factor hardware solutions, time-based passwords, phone apps, especially if they have a push notification where you're like, are you trying to log in now? Yes, like them. Uh, what are some MFA solutions that you avoid? Um, so SMS-based, and uh, that's because uh, even voice-based, anything that really is tied to your telephone number. And that's okay. because the underlying protocol, which is called Signal Security Level 7, uh, it, it's inherently insecure. It's easy to fake being a phone number. It's easy to have the SMS uh, information sent to the attacker's phone. It's easy for me to uh, connect with you over uh, chat and say that I'm, oh, I'm with Google support or Microsoft support and we're trying to do something. Or even if someone calls you and says, hey, we're with, you know, we're with your bank. Did you buy two tickets from Dallas, Texas to Nigeria? Well, we didn't think so, but we're going to send you a code just to verify you are Roger Grimes. And then when, you know, you tell us that code, when you tell them the code, they really just put your account in recovery mode. So with phones and, uh, you know, SMS based stuff, you really, it has really poor authentication. So anything based upon voice or the phone number or SMS, not a big fan. Okay. But isn't, isn't, SMS-based multi-factor authentication still better than using just a logon and password? You know, it, it certainly can be and probably, I guess, in general is, but it's so easy to hack. As a matter of fact, if you talk to a lot of the cryptocurrency experts, there's been people that have been robbed of millions of dollars and they are relying upon one of those apps and then had their phone number redirected and lost all that money. What I tell people is that if you have a login name and password, especially for a critical account, and you know that you can't get fished out of it, but you protect it and you're not gonna put it in on anything but that website, it's, it's probably more secure than SMS. But overall, the way that most people use it, you're probably better off using SMS. But if you're going to go to multi-factor authentication, why go to the weakest you know, alternative of it? Absolutely. If, you're gonna, if you go to MFA, eh, might as well go all the way. So, so you make a really eloquent case for MFA adoption. Uh, I, I can't disagree with anything that you've stated here. What I'm struggling with is why does MFA have such lousy uptake. The majority of people still aren't using it. People who know that their, their passwords, their accounts, their online activities um, are relatively porous and insecure. Why, why aren't more people using MFA? Number one, and maybe it's the, you know, I don't know which one's causing what, but uh, MFA only works on like 2% of the world's websites and services. And the most popular MFA solution you can think of, whether it's RSA Secure ID or Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator, they really only work with a very small subset. Like Google Authenticator only works with Google Chrome on Google, you know, on websites. So you can't use it to, to log into many other places. So part of the problem is 
is that not only does is there not a big uptake of MFA, but there's all kinds of different solutions. And so like right now I have, you know, a bunch of passwords. I have 170 passwords. Thank God I have a password manager, but I also have like five different MFA solutions. One that I use for Facebook, one that I use at work, one that I use to get in my, the building code. So we kind of get this combination of things. And there's things like FIDO2 is, a, is an MFA standard that's trying to standardize so that you can use things across a wide swath of things. But the number one reason why people aren't using MFA more is that login name and password probably works on 98% of the world's websites and MFA works on less than 2%. Okay. Um, Roger, talk to us a bit about how this all relates to the work that you do at No Before. Yeah, the, the biggest thing is I run into a lot of people that are using MFA that think, oh, I can't be hacked, or they think they're significantly less likely to be hacked. And that's a dangerous attitude uh, because uh, me and a bunch of other people can hack every MFA solution multiple ways. So what I tell people is when you get MFA, whether you're an administrator or an end user, you need to be educated about how could it be hacked. Like 90% of MFA solutions can be hacked if you get tricked into going to a bad website. But most people think when they have an MFA token or solution that they don't have to pay attention to that. As a matter of fact, they get told, oh, you can't be fished. And it's just not true. And so when you use MFA, you need to educate the people that are using it that, hey, you still need to worry about these sort of things. Because it'd be like if I gave you a login name and password and absolutely no education about how it might be used against you. Same thing with MFA. Everybody gets to MFA and they're like, all right, finally I got MFA but they're not being educated about the things to look out for that might be able to get around MFA. And if you educate them a little bit, it just makes it a stronger solution. Well, some great insights on authentication and staying safe online. Roger, thanks for joining us today on this Black Hat Fast Chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. We've been talking with Roger Grimes of Know Before. This is Terry Sweeney with Black Hat. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.